It's, it's my enormous pleasure. I'm Jill Tarter, the director of the Center for SETI Research here. And it's my enormous pleasure to um, introduce to you uh, Avinash Agrawal today. Uh, Avinash uh, is, his title is the director of Open Innovation at the SETI Institute. And for the past year and a half, what he's been trying to do is to concretize a wish that I was able to make in 2009 as part of the TED Prize. And Avinash has been trying to write a roadmap for how we get the world involved in SETI to help us do our searches better, to help us get our message out, and to help maybe make the world a better place. Now, it's really hard to imagine what a training program would be for someone who was going to take on that job. Uh, but Avinash worked for 15 years with Sun, and uh, during the during that uh, tenure, he went over and began all of Sun's uh, efforts in in India. He has a degree from uh, from a, a PhD from UC Berkeley, and before that, an, an engineering degree from the Indian Institute of Technology, um, very prestigious educational institution in India, and so. I hope that you will get as excited about what Avinash has been doing with our SETI Quest community as I am. So, Avinash, it's all yours. Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the talk. Thank you for taking time to spend your lunch hour with me here. This is a different talk from the ones you normally hear at this colloquium. I will talk about no profound concepts, and I will have no fancy graphics, but I'll give you something, an ability to act immediately, so much so that you can do it while you're listening to this talk, if you have the right phone device. <laughs> so let, let me uh, lay out what I'm going to talk about over the next uh, 40 minutes, uh, and then at the end of that, we'll take questions. I'll actually. Uh, set aside possibly more time for questions because this is, I prefer an interactive environment. Uh, and we'll do as much of it as we can. So my uh, outline is I'll talk about crowdsourcing and why we are doing crowdsourcing. Uh, what our ultimate aim is in this SETIQuest project. I'll talk about how we are going about achieving that aim and what you, as members of the community can do to participate in the process. So let's start with the crowdsourcing. Uh, we, we've heard the term a lot, and I went on the internet to look for what crowdsourcing is. Uh, number of different explanations. The first one talks about technological advances and how new technology has reduce the difference between what a professional scientist can do and what a lay person can do. And that's absolutely right for us in the SETI environment. Today, people can run our Sonata software on their home computers, which they could not a year and a half ago. So that applies to us. The other part is channeling experts' desire to solve a problem which is absolutely right for us. We have a problem looking for signals, detecting techno signatures in those signals. Uh, and there are people outside who are interested in helping us do that. And the last definition I saw is, it's ideal for large scale, repetitive, yet hard to automate tasks. Now, SETI program collects data from space. And there's a, all we do, day in and day out, is look for signals in that data. So it's an extremely repetitive task. Now, a lot of it can be automated and has been automated. But a significant amount has not been automated because it's just not possible to automate it easily. And that makes crowdsourcing ideal for us. 
go further down, Wikipedia has 108 crowdsourcing projects. That is just a small fraction of what is out there. We are among the 108 projects, but the universe of crowdsourcing projects is very large. So, pe people talk about um, SETI at home and what is the difference? Is not SETI at home crowdsourcing? Yes, SETI at home is crowdsourcing. And so, I go back to my favorite source Wikipedia, uh, which explains the difference in the context of Galaxy Zoo and SETI at home. By the way, how many of you have heard of SETI at home? 100 percent almost. Good. Galaxy Zoo, fairly large number. Galaxy Zoo is a program which allows you to classify galaxies based on their shapes. And you go to their website, galaxyzoo.org, uh, look at galaxies, classify them, and move on to the next galaxy. Uh, the difference, they say, uh, is in citizen science or galaxy zoo type projects, volunteers do their actual work. In SETI at home type environments, their computers do the actual work. So we are doing a citizen science project. And I call it crowdsourcing because our project is a little larger than just the citizen science part of it. So where did we start? Jill Tarter's 2009 TED Prize wish to empower earthlings everywhere to become active participants in the ultimate search for cosmic company. As close to a definition of citizen science as we are looking for. We want to involve the crowds. What do we expect from the crowds? What do we expect them to do? Two things. We want them to help us search for signals. And these are people we call searchers. And we want people to help us make search easier, better, faster, more fun. And these are people we call enablers. So you are both enablers and searchers. And I'll talk about how you can participate in each of these. Let's talk about the, the, the ultimate goal in here. This is the grand vision of the program. What do we to do today? We observe, collect data, we use our software to look for signals in that data. This is what I was talking about. Things that can be automated have been automated. Or things that can be automated easily have been automated. The source code uh, influences are observing. The first thing we want to do is get the community involved in improving our source code, in improving the algorithms that are there so that we can automate more tasks. But that's not all. In terms of observing today, this is where we stop. In terms of the program that we're putting in place, we have a large amount of data that we collect in our observatory. We actually want to give that data to people outside. Uh, there is one application already written called SetiQuest Explorer, and I'll give you a demo of that a uh, little later, which allows you as common people to look at the data that we have and find patterns in that data. Hopefully, as you find patterns in that data, your input will help us modify the stars we are observing, what we do with the data that we collect. We are also looking for people to develop more such applications. Explorer is one app, but we are looking for people to do more apps, which will eventually do the same things. Help us do our observing better and help all of us find extraterrestrial intelligence. So. In terms of where we are, let me tell you the layout of the project itself. A year, a year and a half ago, we used to run our entire project on custom hardware because standard hardware just wasn't fast enough. Over the last few years, we've, uh, hardware has improved a lot, and so we've had to rebuild our infrastructure. The software and the hardware we had one and a half years ago was meant to run only within our offices. Community outside could not do anything with it. 
So the first part that I had to do or we had to do here was change the infrastructure. The second part that we had to do was build applications and services that we run on that infrastructure. These are services that people could use, people outside the community, outside SETI Institute. And the last thing that we had to do was build a community that will actually use these services and contribute back to us. So the first thing in our infrastructure is hardware. And we modified our hardware. I'll talk about that in a minute. Second part was changing the software to run on the new hardware that we had. And changing it enough so that you can run it on any standard hardware server that you have at home. And I, we have people in the community here who are actually running it on their home devices. The third part of the infrastructure that we had to do was create an environment to get data out of our observatory onto the internet so that anyone can get it. Get it. Now, this is not an easy task, given that we collect 100 terabytes of data every day. And we haven't solved the full problem yet. We've solved only a little small part of the problem. <coughs> Going beyond that, as we start working with other projects like Galaxy Zoo, we need an infrastructure that allows us to integrate with them. And that's something we will do. And when everything is set up, we need to operate it on an ongoing basis. So that's the infrastructure part that we're working on. On top of this infrastructure, we have uh, two services that we're offering today, and we'll develop a lot more with your help. The first thing is the source code that we have. We put it out in the open two weeks ago, three weeks ago, on the, 20, on the 1st of uh, March. So anyone out there can now look at our software, do whatever they want to with it. On the 1st, we also developed and uh, released a citizen science app, which is what these devices here are for. And I'll show you uh, in a few minutes what the app, app does. Going forward, we want to look, uh, we want more citizen science applications developed, and we want people to contribute algorithms to help us search better. The third layer for us is building a community. Two aspects of community, getting people to come to us and getting people to stay with us while they contribute to us. So this is the overall roadmap for the project. Where are we on the roadmap? About halfway there. So we've done the hardware, we've done the software, we've done some data, we have released open source software, we've released one citizen science app, and we have the beginnings of a community. Let's go through it in a little more detail. Uh, infrastructure. I talked about us wanting to upgrade or change our hardware. Well, Dell stepped in, and thanks, Dell, for this. They brought in Intel, and they have built an entire new data center infrastructure for us. So that allowed us to move forward. But it wasn't just Dell. Google came in to help us also. By the way, these are pictures of uh, uh, our real data center at Hat Creek. The next step for us was uh, do the software, the software team sitting here. Thanks to Jane, John, Ken. Uh, they took time to move the entire software. We, it now runs on standard devices. And as I mentioned earlier, you can run Sonata software on your home computers. You can detect signals using data that we put out there. So I talked about 100 terabytes a day. We obviously can't put that much on the internet. We, take a small amount of data once a week, put it up on Amazon. Thanks, Amazon, for uh, letting us use their services. Uh, and these are data files that you can get from Amazon. And I have the link here, but you don't need to remember the link. You can go to our website, setiquest.org, to get the data. The next step for us, really, in this infrastructure 
is getting data out in real time. And again, we won't be able to get all our data out. The intelligence would be figuring out what data to get out and how much of it to get out. But once we have real-time data coming out, imagine this. On your home computer, you can get data that comes out from the ATA. You can use our software or modified version of our software, and you can do your own search for ET. This is something that wasn't possible until now. The uh, second part then is once we ported the software, we had to release it in the open source, which uh, as I mentioned, we did three weeks ago. We released it under a GNU GPL license. So you can now download the software, change it, do whatever you want to with it. Uh, We'd like it if you contribute your changes back to us. You don't have to. You can do anything except use it in proprietary products. And uh, the link is out here, but it's also on our website on how to get to our software. The second service that we offered was uh, SetiQuest Explorer. This is an app that runs on uh, Android devices. Right now, only on Android. It actually runs on your browser also. It's Flash-based, so you can run it in your browser. You can run it on your Android device. And uh, we hope we'll make it run on iPhone devices. The idea there is it'll display waterfall data for you so that you can see if there's any pattern in there or not. So let's, let's run a demo here. When you go to explorer.setiquest.org, this is what you see. It will ask you to log in using either your Facebook account or your Google account. Hopefully, most people have one or more of these. If not, it's a 30 second task to create these accounts. Now, let me go into the. So, once you get logged into the application, you can start exploring. And by the way, this is happening in real time. No fake data in here. It will show you data from one particular star that we've collected. And it's randomly selected which star you get. Not only that, it will give you one, it will select one random slot of frequencies that you will see that data from. So this is your star. You, you say, no, I don't want this star. I want a different star. You skip, and then you have a different star. Once you've chosen a star, you can say continue, and it'll show you waterfall plots for that star. Okay, so waterfall plots are um, data that data that's plotted in two dimensions, representing three dimensions actually. Uh, on the x-axis you have frequency. On the y-axis you have time, and the intensity of every dot shows you the power of that signal. So most in this, most of what you see is random noise. There really isn't any signal. Every once in a while, you'll see some number of pixels which are brightly lit, and they form a pattern. We look for typically straight line patterns, because straight line indicates a fixed frequency signal so the idea here is you scroll through it looking for pattern. If we get lucky, we might find a pattern. We may not find a pattern in the real data. I took snapshots uh, of an instance where there was a pattern in the data. But the idea here is if you do see a pattern here, you press the button saying, I see a pattern. And it will then show you a gallery of known patterns. You, uh, you click on the pattern in the gallery which is closest to your pattern and move on. In the back end, that pattern then is reported to us. And I'll talk about what we do with that pattern. So that's what the application does. The idea here is that our software is very good at detecting straight line patterns. Our software does not do anything except straight line patterns. Well, straight line or, or uh, uh, a pulsed straight line. 
where we have gaps in the straight line. But beyond that, we don't do any other pattern. And it's difficult for uh, us to sit down and look at all the waterfall plots. And so we're hoping that the community through this app can actually help us identify other patterns. This runs on, uh, on uh, Android devices, which is things like this, Android phone, things like this, which are uh, Android-based tablet devices. It does run on regular PCs, thank you. Which is where uh, many people will use, but the idea here is you know, you're standing in line at the grocery store waiting, you could be looking at patterns. And it's actually interesting. I've, I've uh, done a little bit of this. Do you really have enough resolution on a phone? Or? Yes. So. So just to give you an idea, here, here it is, and I, I'm sure most of you cannot see it, but if after the talk you want to come up here, this is what it looks like uh, on a tablet device. And I have used it on a phone. Yes, it, there is a chance that si uh, the same signal will be sent to other people, in which case we'll keep track of it, but we'll intentionally send signal to more people once we find it. So yes, that's the first decision point for us. Once someone says, I see a signal, we can send it to more people. Now, not there yet, part of the beta uh, learning for us, and uh, software will be enhanced to do this. So, so what we do is we look at 100 megahertz frequency band at any time. So we collect data between uh, one gigahertz and 10 gigahertz, and we select between two and three bands of 100 megahertz in between them. Yeah. So what happens next when people say, I found a signal, what happens then? So yeah, a caveat here, this, is, this was released a week ago, a week and a half ago. It's in beta right now, and the beta is testing two things. Number one, the software, does the software work or not? and do people find bugs in it? Uh, number two, uh, the process itself. What do we do with uh, the data that people report back to us? So as of yesterday, and we've got only 300 users, by the way, in this system, although about 2,500 have requested to be part of the beta test. So we included 300. Um, and between these 300 people in the last week or so, they've reported 1,600 signals. Now, we are now looking at uh, what to do. So, uh, not in terms of um, you know, what to do with the signals, but in terms of what processes do we put in place to make it easy for us to see how much value there is in those signals. Clearly, you know, when I look at the clouds in the sky, I always see patterns. In there. <laughs> and so, some of them are likely to be that. So you know, we'll take our learnings. We, we're also asking the community for help in figuring out, in developing software to help us uh, make sense of the data that's being returned. Now what, what do we want to do eventually with it? I, I've sort of said this already. Uh, give it to more citizen scientists. If they validate the data or the patterns that have been found, then we uh, send it to our ATA where either scientists or software will look at it and figure out what the next steps are. Next steps could very well be changing, uh, repointing our telescopes in a different direction. Going long term, we want to integrate with other citizen science projects. And Galaxy Zoo is one such project that we've talked to and we're looking at how do we integrate our citizen science part with their citizen science So those are the two applications that we've done. Let's talk, talk about the community, the third thing, b uh, building a community. Now, here, here is a, my view of what the community looks like. 
there is the world, the bottom left, millions, billions of people. We need people to become aware of what we're doing so that they come to our website. So that's the first effort we need to do, an outreach effort. When they come to our website, our website's got to be good enough that they stay with it and they register on the website. So your uh, uh, so th first box is the world, second box is the people that come to the website, third box, people looking up in the sky are people who have registered at the website. When they've registered, we want them to like it so much that they start participating in activities that we have on the website. The primary activity right now is polls. We have a regular polling on the website and I'll show you an example. And participating in forums. There are active discussions going on on the website. So we want people to participate in those discussions. They like them well enough that they want to now start contributing. And that's what we're looking for, making it easy for them to contribute. So, so what we get is the bottom right of the screen, contributions. So this is the participation or, or community path that we are moving towards, getting more people to come, getting more people to register, getting more people to join the community, and getting more people to uh, participate, and then eventually contributing to us. So that's where the project is. Let me talk about how you all can participate. But before I talk about how, let me ask, let me talk about why you should participate. Because you all love SETI. <laughs> <laughs> Otherwise, you wouldn't be taking your lunch time coming here. So on a, on a more serious note, why? So far, when I talk to people, people have ideas on what SETI should do and what SETI should not do. And yet they have no means to, to help influence what we do. Well, here's your chance. You are more knowledgeable than, than most people around on this topic. You have ideas on what should be done. So here's your way, way to influence what we do. You all want continued progress in SETI. We all want to detect a signal. Now, what today, we look for only one kind of signal, strong, narrow signal, like your you know, FM or AM radio. Maybe ET is sending signal using a whole different mechanism. We don't look for them. Maybe you have ideas on how we should, what we should look for and how we should look for them. Help us implement those so that we can look for those signals. You can interact with others in the community. We have, you know, yesterday I got mail from someone who is a freshman in high school who wanted to know more about this. And one of our uh, most active community members is a retired astronomer from Oxford University. Um, and he, you know, when people post questions, he answers them. So you can be one of the two extremes, anyone in between can learn a lot about SETI, about what we're doing, how we're doing, what we should do, or ask general questions. And you can be involved to the extent that you want. And of course, the big carrot, if we ever find a signal, you as the searcher can get a lot of credit for it. And of course, you as the enabler whose tool was used by that searcher will get credit for it. You convinced? <laughs> Good enough thing. So here, here's how you participate. There are five ways. First is be a searcher. I talked about SETI Quest uh, Explorer. Uh, and I'll, I'll, I have one more slide on that, on exactly how you can participate in it. You can be an enabler. Enabler number one is help us improve algorithms. Enabler number two is develop a game uh, or some other apps, and I have a slide on that. The fourth way for you to uh, participate is get the word out, get more people interested. And I'll talk about some specific things we're doing right now. And the fifth way is you tell us. If you have suggestions on how you can, you know, our goal, my goal is to build a community. My, my goal is to get everyone involved. And so if you have ideas on how, tell me. 
So the, the, the question here was, is the software modular enough so that you can unplug one algorithm and plug in a different algorithm in its place? That makes it easier for community members to participate. And my answer to that is not yet. But uh, we that's our desire to go towards that. So he, here are specific ways. Explorer, uh, sign up for the beta program. We initially thought we'll do 100 beta users a week. But the uh, response to our, our uh, uh, announcing the program has been huge. Almost 2,500 people have signed up so far. So we are going to increase the pace of uh, adding more people in the beta. Once you're in the beta, help us improve the software itself. You know, say, I don't like this. In fact, we've already made changes. The first change we made was uh, we, you could log in using only Facebook. And I got grilled for that big time. <laughs> <laughs> so we added uh, uh, Google also as another mechanism. So we're making changes based on what people are telling us. Um, help us improve the process you talked about. You know, do we want to not duplicate? Do we want to duplicate in there? People may have suggestions. Help us make sense of data. And I talked about it earlier, so I'm going to move on. Open source software. So if you are into software and you want to help us improve the software, there's three ways, four ways you can do it. You can develop software. You can document what we have. You can port it to other operating systems. And I'll talk about what it runs on right now. And you can test the software that we have. And we have an open mechanism where you can see all the bugs that have been found, all the suggestions that are there. You can report your own suggestions in there. Here's where our software lives. This is you know, for people who are interested in um, modifying or even looking at software, it's on the internet. Anyone can go get to it. And all the links are on our website, so don't need to remember anything in here. A little bit of uh, detail on the software. It's, uh, it runs on uh, OpenSUSE Linux, which runs on any of your uh, uh, standard hardware. Uh, most of the code is in C, C++, and Java, although some of it is in some esoteric languages. Yeah. But these three are mostly sufficient. We do use a lot of packages, uh, FFTW and other DSP packages. And if you want to run it on your home computer, all you need is a dual processor 64-bit machine with 4G memory. Yes. OK. Talking about uh, developing new apps, so that's the third thing that you uh, can do or tell others to do. Um, so first is you will have access to the same data that SETIquest Explorer has today. Uh, all they do is go to our website, get all the data, and run the app off it. The goal clearly is to detect patterns. The ultimate goal is to find a signal from ET. But for the app, the goal is to find a pattern which will then help us detect signals. And what we're looking for is if you have ideas on new ways of user interaction, which is clearly a game. game uh, games are new ways to not just interact with users, but encourage them. New ways to visualize data. So I showed you waterfall plots black and white. Last Friday, someone in the community, a beta tester, said, why are you doing black and white? What did they say? Yellow and some other color actually stand out. And they said they port pointed to some, some study which says that's better. So that's yeah, something we'll look at. You may have better algorithms, and you may want to run it on other platforms. Today, it runs only on, on your browser, uh, if it has Flash 10.2 or, or Android. Maybe you have ideas to run it on totally different platform. Who's already helping us? So four categories of people. We have an in-house team, uh, a very small team. We have external affiliates, companies that have agreed to work with us. We have loose associates. And I know these things don't mean much. I'll tell you in a minute who they are. And we have the community outside. So who are our external affiliations? Amazon, um, they're giving a, letting us use their cloud services. Dell, Intel, and Google have given us software, I'm um, sorry, hardware. Adobe sponsored the 
explorer app that we've been talking about. And the app itself was done by Heather Sage Group. GitHub uh, hosts our uh, software repository. Palamida helped us uh, scan the software to make sure that we don't have any uh, encumbrances before we released it. And lots and lots of individuals have formally helped us. Loose associations, and I want to take two minutes to talk about it. We've got an uh, intern working from San Jose State University. Uh, during the summer, as part of our REU program, uh, we'll get an intern. Uh, we have a bunch of students from Carnegie Mellon who are doing their master's project with us. And we just got accepted into the Google Summer of Code program. By the way, how many of you know of Google Summer of Code program? Very small numbers. Let me take a minute to talk about it. it it's a way for Google to encourage participation in open source projects. And they hire interns for the summer. They pay interns to work on other open source projects. So organizations apply to Google asking for interns that Google pays for, uh, for their projects, which we applied last week. Friday, they informed us that they have selected us as one of their projects. Now, the program is open to students anywhere in the world. They have to look at our web page, uh, look at the projects that we offer, submit a proposal to us. And we will, from that, select which students do which part of our project. So if you know students who may be interested in this, absolutely let them know that you know, this program is going on. And by the way, we are not the only ones. They have 100 other organizations that they are supporting through this program. So <clears throat> the application uh, opens next Monday, and it closes in two weeks, actually. Uh, the week after the following Friday. So on the 28th, applications open. And on 8th of April, applications close. So if you know of students, tell them. And tell them to apply for us. OK, so coming back to uh, community. You know, we have people in the community helping us. And what are they doing today? You know, of course, we have poll questions on our website, participating very actively in our forums. People are contributing. We have a wiki on our website, which talks about everything that we are doing. And Eric is here. Eric Olson, who is one of the three people in the community who has put the wiki together. Uh, the other person is Walder, who is a student in Portugal. And the third person is, uh, uh, lives in uh, Marine County, Sonoma County, somewhere up there. And three of them, never having met each other, have contributed totally as external people on uh, building our wiki. We've got uh, uh, blogs, and we've got guest blogs going on. So if you uh, are interested in writing a guest blog, absolutely let me know uh, or send your uh, blog to me. We have an internet relay chat, which is open 24 hours a day, although I'm not on it 24 hours a day. Uh, but on Tuesdays, 11 AM to noon, we always have a meeting. Anyone in the world can join, and people from all over the world do join. We have Twitter. We have a Twitter equivalent called Identica. We have we not doing using Facebook and LinkedIn as much, but we will, and we're looking at other means to uh, engage with the community. But most of these are going on today, being done by the community. So here is what our uh, website looks like. In fact, okay. So this is our uh, uh, website. Uh, the, the four tabs that you see here, Static West Programs, Explore the Sky Yourself is for Citizen Science or Explorer. Uh, this tab is for people who are interested in writing new apps. And the last tab is for people who are interested in contributing to software. Up here, uh, these are ways for people to uh, participate in. So you know, discussion forums, wiki, uh, blog, and we have an FAQ. And down here is a poll. So I put this poll question yesterday, and we've got a few people voting on it. So that's all I have, and I hope you'll uh, join us on setiquest.org. Thanks.
So before I open the questions to you, I have a question, Avinash. Uh, yeah. I think maybe we need a little bit more uh, detail on the difference between what we're doing now with stored data in the cloud and what our eventual objective is with real-time, closed-loop, four-minute cycles. Thank you. So um, the goal event, we do real-time observing. So if we find a potential signal in the data that we collect, we go back to that star and collect more data from that star and analyze it to see if there's a real signal in there. And we have a protocol where we uh, take the telescope off the star, put it back on the star, off star, on star, do it five times in there. Now, uh, and if, if uh, a signal survives our five level protocol, then we do have a signal, which we haven't got to yet. Uh, so, and it's important for us to do this in real time because we may be getting a signal right now that may not be present tomorrow. And so what we're doing is as people, once we start getting real time data out of our observatory, we want people to be um, looking through the explorer, finding signals, and if they do find a signal, we'll immediately turn around and send it to 10 other people. And if they confirm the validity of that signal, we get the information back and in real time, we will then move the telescope back to that star and reobserve and, and start that protocol. So that's the goal where you know, citizen scientists out in the community are really helping us uh, change the direction, helping us focus the telescopes on particular stars. And that, that so real time citizen science is our goal. And I mentioned there are a lot of crowdsourcing projects. There are lots of citizen science projects outside, but uh, we would probably be the first one to do real time science using this. Two questions. One, how much research have you done into pattern recognition? Because this seems like it could be mind-numbingly boring, which is exactly what computers are good at. Uh, Th that's the main one. Yeah. We, so our challenge right now is we don't know what patterns to look for. Once we identify the patterns, then, it's, then we look at uh, how to automate the process. So we are asking the community to, to tell us where to go, which direction to go in, and if those patterns make sense or not. So in terms of uh, real pattern recognition research, not much, but we're just hoping that uh, once we get patterns, then we can start looking at how to detect those patterns. And that's where our uh, pattern recognition software becomes important. So, so I have a question. Ah. Um, you know, when you, we were sh when you were showing- I'm sorry. Over here. Okay, thanks. Uh, when you were showing the um, waterfall chart, Yeah. Um, it seemed real obvious to me that there's a, when there's a, a vertical line, I mean, that's just summing that up. Why, you gotta have an algorithm to be able to do that. Why, why do we have to look at it to find that? You know, uh, we are just putting raw data out there. We're not filtering anything out. And so I, I mentioned that straight lines, whether they're vertical or, or tilted, our algorithm finds it very easily. In fact, we, we find it much better than an eye can. But other patterns, an eye can do much better than we can. Actually, when we start putting out the real data, I mean, Avinash told you there's 100 terabytes a day. We're not streaming that out of a remote observatory to anybody's mobile devices. Um, we have to select what data we send out. And the data that we're going to be sending out are those small portions of the frequency band where there are so many signals that we already detect plus many that we probably don't yet detect, that our system can't deal with them and cannot do the categorization and the, the classification and the um, description of these signals. So we're going to be sending out the crowded bands. That's where we really want people to help us make the system learn how to do the job better by seeing how humans do it and finding the patterns that might be there that we can't yet define. In a way, that's exactly what you're doing. You're going to become the expert um, uh, rule set that we will use to, uh, to make the system better. Other questions? 
Uh, regarding the, I'd love to help develop software, and, and I have a somewhat older CPU that I'd be happy to run Linux on. Is there any, I can't make it go above two gig though. I mean, is there any hope for, or, or do I, you know, because I'm not gonna buy a whole new system for this. In interesting thought, so uh, we have the software out in the community and maybe someone in the community will find optimizations in there. The, the challenge is, you know, inherently it's a hard problem. And we, this is, we just migrated to running on standard hardware only recently until now. I mean, we actually did it last September, October, December. Before that we were running on custom hardware. So now we're happy that it runs on standard hardware. We will now you know, be looking for help from the community in seeing how they can optimize it further so that it can run on low powered CPUs. But today it doesn't. Other question. Thanks. <coughs> Looking at your device here, I see a, a dark line every now and then. Is that where you stitch them together or what? Yeah. yeah. Th okay. Thanks for detecting it. Yeah. That, that's an issue that we are addressing. It is a problem. Definitely. Yes. So I'm still trying to get clear on what it will and won't run on. So you said it's um, browser-based, so it should work on a Mac or a PC with Kay. adequate memory, et cetera. Um, you mentioned. So, so I, okay, go ahead, and then no. I'll answer together. Okay, uh, well, answer that part first. Go okay, ahead. so I, I want to distinguish between the, the signal detection software and the explorer. So the Explorer app will run on your browser, your Mac, your PC. Uh, it just needs Flash 10.2. Right. So if it doesn't, your, your PC will complain and tell you click here to download it, and you'll download it. Okay, and then you um, said it won't work on an iPhone, but it will work on an Android-based yes. phone. Um, but the um, iPad-type devices, will it run on an iPad? No. Or just? No. It, it, not in its current form. Current form. Okay, so that's when you're working. You will work toward. Uh, we are hoping someone in the community will we'll help. work toward it. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> okay, other questions for Avinash? These oh, are. Okay. Um, you mentioned that the the um, the data that's available to the Explorer app will be available to other app developers. Yeah. Is that available now, or is that it's something planned in the future? No, it's there. So, so it's there on the website. Yeah, it's there on the website. So what Explorer is doing is getting going to the website, downloading all the data, and then it stores it on their own oh. server. So actually, the data are in the cloud. The link to it's on the website. <coughs> Two questions, one kind of silly. Um, the gizmo that you're passed around, uh, several of us noted there's a continuing dark line, a uh, horizontal dark line. I presume that's also an artifact of the device rather than anything meaningful. Um, I hadn't noticed, but I assume so. It's an artifact of the data collection. So that's okay. one piece of time, and so there is a hookup. And the second one is, so if what all your volunteers, hopefully thousands, um, are doing is interacting with the system in a way that eventually trains your software to do it instead, uh, will there come a time fairly soon when all the volunteers are told, thanks, we don't need you anymore? The time may come, although I don't know if it's fairly soon. Uh, I think that idea here is we, we wh whoever said that Bush or someone, the, you know, there's known unknowns and unknown unknowns, right? <laughs> so <laughs> uh, 
our, our challenge is the unknown unknowns. In other words, we don't know what we're looking for. You know, if, if there are patterns that we know are there, then those are the known unknowns and we can write our software to do this. If there's a whole new different kind of patterns which we know nothing about and they, they may come, uh, then those will be difficult. Uh, you know, we, we can't do them unless we know about them. So the key, to, to paraphrase what you're saying is over time, as we take more patterns and code them in our software, there will be fewer and fewer patterns for volunteers to find. That's certainly possible. Yeah, we're at first, I think what we're doing is presenting the volunteers with a black swan problem. There are all these white swans. Can you help us clear it out, identify them, so that maybe we can look through this crowded part of the spectrum and see if there's a black swan among the population? That's what we're asking to help with first. And then we want to provide tools. I mean, this is a citizen science project. We want to provide tools to allow people to go off on their own exploration. So right now, we use a number of different techniques to decide that a particular signal is interference. And we put it in a database and we forget it. We don't ever try and figure out what caused the interference. And might it be possible if we knew what it was, to schedule around it, to open up that piece of the spectrum. Um, that's a really nice set of research tasks that people who have the interest and have the time can begin to help us with. All right, now this is a signal. Well, what caused it? And there are a lot of tools, you know, you know web-based tools that we can turn people onto to help them answer those questions for us. And so this will evolve in time. And if you, um, if the community defines and generates pattern recognition applications that we can get efficient enough to run in real time as additional clients along with the pulse and CW detectors we're currently running, and, and we come up with a system that is absolutely sensitive to all anomalies, no matter what they are, would that be so bad? I mean, I, I, I declare success for a while and, and use that tool. So we'll see where we go. I mean, there's often a slide we use, which is SETI Quest will be what you make it, because we don't really know where it's going to go. Did you have another question? Yes. So, so yeah. So the uh, yeah. So um, um, go ahead. Right from your words. Yes. So you mentioned several different research ideas. Are there a list of these things that you're looking for help with? Yeah. So on our website, we've got um, there's three places you can go to. Number one is we can have an I we have an ideas page where we write our ideas. And, you know, people can write ideas. Eric has written ideas on there on, on what we could be doing. Um, that's the first place. Second place is we have an issues database where it's very easy to use, issues.setequest.org. You go in there and um, you can see everything that people have reported there. And you can report your own issues if you like. So that's the second place where we need help, you know, addressing those ideas or ideas and issues. And the third thing is a simple one. Uh, we created a separate page for Google Summer of Code where we've actually put uh, specific projects that can be done by a student in one summer. They don't have to be done by a student. They don't have to be done in one summer. So that's something you could uh, look at. Yeah, I'm just curious. Is the, uh, the CouchDB interface going to be shut down? Uh, to or some extent, improved? Yes. I used it quite a bit about a year ago when it first came out. And I, it, it, was, it was difficult. Yeah. That, that's a challenge. We, we were trying to you know, put a round peg in a square hole or whatever it was. Uh, we, the, the software wasn't meant to do what we were trying to do. And we tried to make it work. And it sort of worked, but just was a pain to maintain. So. Yeah. All right, I'd like to thank Avinash one more time for being willing to, to jump in at short notice and give us an update on a a program that's in progress because you know most scientists don't like to tell you about what they're doing until it's all wrapped up with a bow and they've got the paper accepted. So 
thank you. This is a work in progress, and we're going to make more progress. Thank you, Avinash. Thanks.